I have the joy of introducing the person who's going to preach today. His name is Adam Barr. Many of you know him. He's been a favorite and a regular here at Shoreline Church. Adam is the lead pastor of Peace Church in West Michigan. He is an author, a leader, an innovator, and really a top thinker in the church today. Adam is also the host of the Organic Outreach International podcast. If you don't listen to that podcast, you ought to check it out. He hosts that on a regular basis. Uh, he has a wonderful wife, Jen, and four sons because he wanted to outdo me by one. I have three sons, he has four. Adam's been a friend for many, many years. We've asked him to preach today on the commandment, don't lie or speak the truth. And Adam's a great person to talk about this topic. I want to invite you to give Adam Barr a warm Shoreline welcome. <laughs> yeah. I love Shoreline, man. It's so good to be here. It's good to see you guys. Every time I come here, it's, my, it's like coming back to my West Coast family. Uh, I love the chance to be with you. And, and one of the, the joys for me personally is, uh, of c- coming back uh, year after year and being here a number of different times is that I, there's honestly, there's big things that have happened in my life that I, sometimes, I, I mark around the rhythm of having been here at Shoreline Church. Um, I, I was, as I was getting ready for this sermon, I was remembering a trip I took here uh, to speak uh, for one of the Organic Outreach Conferences. I took a trip here with my, my oldest boy, who at the time was 12 years old. Uh, and Ben and I came out here, and we hung out with the Organic Outreach Conference, and he got to worship here. And it was one of the most awesome trips that we got to have together as a, as a father and son. Well, guess what? That 12-year-old boy is now 16, which means What? Right? So this last year, we went through the whole process of getting him trained up and doing that stuff. And the driver instructor told us, um, look, it's a lot more dangerous for this guy than it was for you. And he was speaking to my wife and I. And at first I looked at him like, you know, what are you talking? He said, look, they drive in the age of the smartphone. How many of you know he's exactly right? I mean, he said, he said your son could do everything right but the truth is, is he could, he could be going through an intersection with a green light and someone could come plowing through, doing one of these numbers, and plow right into your kid. He says, so that he needs to be extra vigilant, right? And, and that, that really sobered me. I started thinking about just the reality. Here, I'm, you know, when you hand, I hand my son a, a set of car keys, he's climbing into a vehicle that can, could potentially lead to his or somebody else's death. How many of you, how many of you know, when, when I realized that, when I saw that, I thought, Okay, I need to impress this upon him. And I said, son, I need your solemn promise. I said, you need to understand something. This is a powerful vehicle that we're giving you. And you could run into another person and your, your whole life could be changed if you don't take this seriously. So I need your solemn promise. I'm never gonna do the cell phone thing while you're driving down the road. And he said, dad, I promise. I'm really glad he made that promise. I think we, we often tend to underestimate how certain things, how, how dangerous or powerful certain things can be until they're out of control. Like fire, for instance. Uh, anybody ever, you know, burn a pile of leaves? Are you allowed to do that in California? You're not? Okay, well, don't worry. People in Michigan make up for what you don't burn. I promise you that. Lots of country, lots of burning going on, and it's a lot of fun. But I'm going to tell you, I've been around fires where it's like suddenly this fire starts getting out of control, and it gets, suddenly you realize, I'm not the one who's in control of this situation anymore, and this is really dangerous. Or if you've ever gone swimming in the ocean, and, and at first, you know, you think you're riding the waves, but suddenly you realize the wave is riding you, uh, you realize how powerful that ocean really is. I think one of the things that we underestimate probably more than anything else is the power of this thing right here. The power of our tongue. I think we especially underestimate it when, we, when we're talking about other people. Let's be honest. But let me ask you this. How many of you, if I ask you to do this, I'm not gonna ask you to do this, but if I ask you to raise your hand if you still remember something really hurtful and painful that someone had said to you in the past? How many of you could raise your hands? Probably most of you, right? Right, this room would be filled. It's amazing how something that someone spoke over us, spoke into our lives, or said about us, it sticks with you year after year. And here you could be decades later, 
and you can still remember something. I can go back to first grade or kindergarten and still hear something said in my mind. That alone gives us a sense of just how powerful words are. And it's one of the reasons that we see that in the Ten Commandments, the Lord chooses to set up guardrails for our lives when it comes to the power of our tongues. And God, God does this not to just control us. He does this to protect us from something that can be incredibly dangerous. So I want to ask you to open up your Bibles if you would. We're looking at, at Exodus chapter 20. And this ninth commandment comes to us in verse 16. So Exodus 20, 16, this is what we read. And it's very simple. It's also going to be on the screen. Here it is. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, whether you're in the room or you're watching online right now, I want you to, uh, to, to say that, those, those very words with me. Let's say it together. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Okay, good. We're going to see this morning that this commandment not to do something is also a call to do something. So we're also looking at another passage, and I'll read that one for us this morning. It's in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32, and this is what uh, we read. This is the, the Apostle Paul who's writing to a group of Christians in the first century, and this is what he says. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. I'm reading a little bit extra. Sorry, guys. I'm re- uh, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are angry. And here we pick up here in verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. The commands that God gives us are are calls not to do certain things. They're calls to do certain things. And they're reminders that we are in this world on a mission that God has given us. And and this morning, we're gonna look at all that, and we're gonna center on this one idea. And here's the main idea that I want you to take away if you don't get anything else today. Truthful tongues bring heaven to earth. Would you say that with me? Truthful tongues bring heaven to earth. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you speak to us in your word. We thank you that you're a God who communicates, and Lord, because you're a God who communicates, you're a God who takes our communication very seriously. This morning, Lord, we pray that we would see uh, both the great power of the tongue and the great potential of our tongue, and to take it seriously, Lord. Let us be conduits of your love and grace in this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen and amen. So truthful tongues bring heaven to earth. So as I said earlier, the commands that, that are given to us in the Ten Commandments are framed as like, don't do these sorts of things. So, so God is, is a loving God who wants to build boundaries into our lives. And he says, I don't want you to do certain things. And in this text, in, in, in Exodus 20, 16, he's saying, don't use your words to destroy. Look at the commandment again in verse 16 of Exodus 20. He says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now the picture that's being given here is the picture of a courtroom. Um, This idea of false testimony. Uh, If you're in a court of law, uh, one of the important things that you're called to do if if you're called as a witness is to speak truthfully about what actually happened. And this was even more important in Israel because in Israel they didn't have DNA evidence and they didn't have uh, fingerprint evidence, they didn't have video footage and all these different things that could either convict or exonerate another person. So in the court of law of Israel's day, one of the most important forms of evidence was testimony. And so testimony, honest testimony was critically important. It could condemn someone to death or it could exonerate them and save their lives. It's important to see that in the Ten Commandments, what God does is he kind of picks out one of the most important examples of a whole family of issues. So when the Lord says um, not to tell a lie in court, 
How many of you know he's talking about more than the way you conduct yourself if you're ever called, along, called upon to be a witness in a court of law? Well, that, that sin, that, that, the critical nature of that issue is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's really just one of the most glaring examples of a whole family of behaviors and attitudes and actions that are incredibly destructive. And what God is saying to us is, is just as, as someone could speak in a court of law and bring destruction if they give a false testimony, we need to be asking ourselves a question. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Do I use my tongue to destroy? Do I use my tongue to damage? Do I use my tongue to gossip? Do I use my tongue to undermine people's reputations? You see, all those family of sins are interrelated with that idea of giving a false witness. And they all, in one way or another, bring destruction. Now, if you pay attention at all in our world, let me ask you a question. Do people in our culture routinely use their tongues to damage and destroy? I mean, it's just, it's just kind of taken for granted. People don't really even think about it. And, and that's why it's so critical for us to understand that as Christians, we're called to have a totally different approach to communication. Because when we join with the world and speak in those ways, we lose our saltiness. We lose our light. We forget what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. And we're not really able to be a witness. It's even more tragic when Christians use their tongues to damage and to destroy, okay? And that's what Paul gets at in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you flip back over to Ephesians 4, uh, look at verse 29. Uh, Paul says this, he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And then look at verse 30. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Everyone say, I am sealed. I am sealed. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, Paul wants you to know something. That God has, has put a seal on you. Just like when you have an official legal document, you get that thing notarized, right? And, and the, the notary seal indicates that this is a legally binding uh, contract. And what, what Paul is saying is that the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian is God's seal of approval on his promise to love us and to be with us. Is there anything better than that? The promise of Christianity is not just a, a message about how to get somewhere when we die. The promise of Christianity is that while we live here on this earth, we can walk in fellowship with God. If that doesn't get you moving, I check your pulse. I mean, the God of the universe wants to be your friend. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to walk with you. And the presence of the Holy Spirit is evidence of this. And what Paul tells us is that th this God who dwells in us and with us, he, tell he tells us something else that is actually, to me, is shocking. Again, verse 30, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, when we speak words that destroy, words that damage, words that undermine other people or undermine Christian community, we're grieving the Holy Spirit because we've set ourselves at cross purposes with the God who has died to save and redeem us. This God who spoke life over us, right? When we were his enemies, when we didn't deserve anything from him, when we had set ourselves against him, he didn't respond in kind. Instead, he came. He came into this world. He shed his blood for us. That's the kind of sacrificial love that God demonstrates to us. And he spoke salvation over us. And when we use our tongues to destroy, especially members of our own community as Christians, especially the people we love the most, which is, let's face it, that's very often where damaging words happen the most. When we do that, we're doing the very opposite of the heart of God. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that God wants to do is just give us a really clear commandment 
Don't use your tongues to destroy. Don't use your tongues to damage. Don't speak lies about people. Instead, regard the Holy Spirit who dwells in your heart. And that, that's what we don't want to do. Then we also are given something to do. God wants to reveal to us something that's important. And, and we realize that God loves us. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And so he wants us to use our tongues and use our words to bring life, to bring life to other people. Uh, again, back there in Ephesians, look at verse uh, 30, uh, verse 29, excuse me. Do, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So we're not only called not to use certain kinds of speech, we're called to speak in certain ways. And here we're given two really great questions that we should ask ourselves before we speak. Uh, get these questions in your heart, get them in your mind, maybe write them down, because they're the, kind, they're the kinds of questions that will help us be people who are more intentional with speaking the right kinds of things. The first question that we need to ask ourselves is this, are the words I'm about to speak going to build up this other person? Now, is that a simple question? But how many of us pause and ask that question <laughs> before we speak to other people? I mean, especially the people we love the most. I'm guessing I'm not the only one in this room who knows to, how to press the buttons of someone that I love, right? You know how to inflect that. You could even use a question to do it. You know how to use just the right inflection or just the right tone or just the right word to, to, to actually take someone down a notch or two, amen? Come on, we're experts at this, aren't we? But that's not the kind of speech God wants from us. Ask yourself, is what I'm about to say going to build this person up or not? Second question. Ask yourself, is this the kind of speech this person needs? Am I giving them what they need? Paul talks about being helpful to build others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now get this. We have been put in this world not to serve our own needs. We're called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and say, what do the people around me, what do they need? What we have, we, we're called to be attuned to the needs of people and to reach out and use our language to build a bridge, to build a connection, to build support from our hearts and our lives into their hearts and their lives. Question, how many of you remember the first time you crossed the Bixby Bridge? If you're from around here. Right? Do you, do you remember that? I can remember it. My wife and I had come here. I was preaching at Shoreline, and we, we took a vehicle, and we went on a drive down, uh, down, the, down the road, Pacific Coast Highway, and as we, we get to the Bixby Bridge, we get there, and it's foggy. <laughs> and can I tell you something? I'm not normally, normally a nervous driver, but that was freaky. It really was. I mean, the bridge is narrower than most bridges, right? It's longer than a lot of bridges, and it's way higher than a lot of bridges. And I can tell you something. As I was crossing across that bridge, I was really grateful for the guardrails on either side of me. Amen? And what Paul wants us to understand is that our lives are meant to be lives that bridge the gaps between us and other people. We're called to bridge those gaps with love. And, and our tongues are a powerful way that we bridge those gaps. And, and those two questions, is this going to build them up and is this what they need to hear? Those two questions help us build that bridge of communication from our lives into the life of another person. So God wants our, our tongues to be used to cross barriers with other people. And, and, and that's important. I, I want to just remind you of the, the very first uh, thing that we talked about, though, because there's more than just us building relationships with people that God wants to do. It's this, truthful tongues bring heaven to earth. Would you say that with me? Truthful tongues bring heaven to earth. Listen, this is incredible. God doesn't just want you to use your, your, your tongue in a way that builds relationships between you and other people. God wants you to use your tongue so that his very life will flow through you into the lives of other people. Is that incredible or what? Think about that. Uh, in, in fact, we have to as Christians, if you're a believer in Jesus this morning, we need to understand something. 
that one of the only ways that people in the world are going to come into, the, into contact and really grasp that they're in contact with God's love and God's reality is through us. And so if that's going to happen, then we have to be different than the world around us. And how many of you know the world around us is defined by a cycle of destructive interaction? Seriously. I mean, it's part and parcel of the world that we live in. Just go to social media, check out Twitter, and you're going to find out there are people who make their names by destroying other people, right? I mean, listen to the way that it happens at the, the upper level of geopolitics, right? This nation says to that nation, well, you better not do this or we're going to bomb you or you better not do this or we're going to sanction you or you better not, right? I mean, we live in this world where there's this, the, 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 we constantly hear messages of, of, of destruction and damage. But you, again, you bring it down to the most basic levels of our homes, or our workplaces, uh, this culture is marked by destructive interaction. And what the Lord wants us to understand this morning is that we are called to speak of a different world. We're not called to represent and reflect the systems of this world. We're called to reflect the kingdom of God. As gospel people who have been saved And set free by the blood of Jesus Christ, we should represent to the world a different kind of way of acting and being. Look at at, at Ephesians one more time. There in verse 32. Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in God forgave you. Everyone say, Christ forgave me. That has to be the starting point for us. That has to be the starting point of our communication, our knowledge, our awareness of what God has done, that while we were still sinners, Jesus came into this world and he died for us, that Jesus is working in us, that Jesus is transforming us. And it's from that that deep level conviction that we then speak into the lives of other people. And it's that conviction that allows us to say, I'm not gonna be conformed to the world around me. I'm gonna be transformed by the vision and the values of Jesus Christ. And I'm gonna build bridges. And and here's the incredible thing, that when we embrace this call to discipleship, which is what I'm talking about, when we embrace this call to become different kinds of people. It's more than just us reaching out to people. We're not just nice people trying to be nice people. God himself is reaching out through us. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. John 7, 38. Jesus is talking about what happens when we follow Jesus. And this is what he says. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. Isn't that beautiful? (laughs) Isn't that a beautiful picture? If you believe in Jesus, something is gonna rise up within you. Life, living water, is gonna flow out of you. The the, the biblical imagery of a river is critical. It's important. And we read about it in Genesis chapter, chapters one and two. We read about this beautiful river in the Garden of Eden. Uh, In the the prophet Ezekiel talks about a river that flows from the temple and brings life to the world around it. And in the book of Revelation, we read about a river that flows from underneath the throne of God. And on the banks of this river, there are fruit trees that bring healing to the lives of people. Isn't that beautiful? Listen, when you follow Jesus, when you say, I'm not gonna be conformed to this world's pattern of destructive communication, I'm gonna be a a mouthpiece for the kingdom of God, there is something more than you in your human capacity that is now brought into the lives of other people. God is reaching out and making an appeal through you to the lives of other people and suddenly you become a conduit of God's amazing grace. You become a conduit of Jesus' unfailing love. And and through you, you can actually change the atmosphere. How many of you want to change the atmosphere around you sometimes? 
You want it to look different. You want it to feel different. You're like, what is going on here? Listen, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, his very life will flow through you. As you say, I'm not going to follow the pattern of this world. I'm going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and let his life flow in me. And friends, right here, right here in our mouths, this is where it starts. So I want to close by just presenting to you some practical choices. I'm going to have to blow through these. I hope you stay with me, okay? First choice that we have to make if we want to, uh, to, to, to allow this reality of God's life to flow through us. First choice is, is faith or fear. Faith or fear. Our use of words ultimately reflects our level of confidence in God. The way we speak ultimately reflects whether or not we are, are, are embracing the truth about who God really is and who we really are or we're living in fear. A lot of times we live in fear, don't we? We're afraid that maybe God's taken his hand off the steering wheel, right? Do you ever feel that way? Like, oh no, and, and when we do that, when we forget that God is in charge, that God, we, we can trust God's, gonna, is he, he's got a plan, that's good news. Uh, it, when we forget that, we suddenly, we wanna control. And, and very often, negative speech and negative patterns of behavior and interaction with other people, it's, the, it's a reflection of someone who's seeking, who's afraid and is seeking control. But when we have faith in God, suddenly we have a different perspective on life. Let me ask you a question. Do you, when you encounter people, do you really believe that Every person you're in, you encounter is someone that Jesus willingly went to the cross to redeem. Do you believe that? That's, that's good news this morning. Do you believe that right now, whenever you meet somebody, this isn't just a human level interaction, but that God in one way or another is reaching out and making an appeal to that person to draw closer to him. Do you believe that this morning? That's what God's word teaches. Do you have faith that it's true? You know, our, our, our call as Christians is to embrace what God's word says. And what God's word says is that our interactions with these people, is, they're, they're part of a much larger picture. And it's the picture of God reaching out through us to them. And when we find it easy to be harsh, sharp, denigrating to people, it's because we've forgotten that ultimately those people are on a journey with God that's either gonna lead them to him or they're eventually gonna be led away from him. We need the eyes of faith to see the critical nature of our interactions with people around us. Second one, Gratitude or grumbling? Gratitude or grumbling? How many of you know it's easy to grumble? It's not hard. It comes very easy to all of us. Um, I, I talked about my family. One of the things that we do as a family, whenever we sit down and have a meal together, is one of the, one of the features of our family dinner is highs and lows. Anybody do that kind of thing? Right? Uh, you know, what was something good? It doesn't have to be the best thing that's ever happened to you, but what's something good that happened to you today? What's the reason you have to give thanks? And what was something that was tough for you today? And, and we've said to our kids, if you can't think of something really tough that happened, we'll, we'll let you off the hook. Because kids don't always want to talk. <laughs> they don't always want to let you know. And so, but, but the thing we never allow you not to do is to say something for which you're grateful. Because we always have something for which to be grateful, don't we? Now, we're not trying to get our kids to be Pollyanna, like, oh, I'm happy all the time. It doesn't matter if you feel really happy right now. What you do need to do is remember who God is and what God's done in your life. And suddenly, the way that you speak changes. It's easy to grumble about people. Can I get an amen? It's easy to grumble about that one person. If only that one person wasn't in my life, God, I would have more love. If only that person wasn't in my life, God, I'd have more peace. If only that person wasn't in my life, I wouldn't feel so stressed. 
What if we flip that just a little bit? And we say, Lord, whoo, this is hard. Lord, thank you for using that person. <laughs> thank you for using that person to reveal how I look for peace in things besides you. You are sovereign and you put that person in my life to show me that I don't love like Jesus loves. That I need more of your grace, Lord. Thank you. And here's the beautiful thing. When we come to that realization, he always gives us more grace. Number three, trust or suspicion. <clears throat> I, could, I would love to unpack this a lot, but the truth is we, we in, in our culture today, and the, people talk about this at all different kinds of levels, we are incredibly connected through technology and we're incredibly isolated when it comes to actually rubbing shoulders with other people. Do you know what I'm talking about? And one of the things that happens in a culture like that is that people become very suspicious of each other. You can do all kinds of statistical research and, and say people are actually much safer than they've ever been. And yet if you talk to a parent with, with children, they're nervous, right? Helicopter parents, we wanna do everything we can to protect because the world's a terrible place, right? And so we isolate ourselves and we look at people with eyes of suspicion. But we as, as Christians, we have the opportunity to be different. And instead of communicating to another person, until you prove yourself, for, and until you prove to me that you're someone I can, I can relate to, I'm gonna hold you really hard out there at arm's length. Instead of doing that, we communicate just as Jesus crossed the bridge between heaven and earth to come here and reach out to me. How can I reach out to you? Number four, protecting or provoking, protecting or provoking. You know, it's very easy to provoke suspicion about other people. <laughs> it's very easy to, to find out something about somebody else and promote that and use it to provoke suspicion. In fact, I actually, one of the, I would say one of the most insidious things that we as human beings do, and I think if you're honest with yourself, you'd probably say you can see it in yourself at one time or another. How, have you noticed how often we as human beings use gossip to help build a bridge between yourself and another person? Come on, you've seen it before. Someone goes, did you hear about so-and-so? And suddenly you're on the inside of this little circle with that person. You now are on the inside of that knowledge. And you have a choice in that moment. Are you gonna provoke this fire of gossip? Or are you gonna seek to protect that person that's being talked about? I look at it this way. It's like everybody has, has one of two buckets in their hands. And, and when the fire of gossip starts, you either have a bucket of gasoline that you pour onto this thing and you make the fire grow, or you have a bucket of water that you pour onto it and say, no. The Bible says that love believes the best. Finally, last one. Gospel or get along. It's easy to get along with our culture. It's easy just to go from day to day and go from thing to thing. But listen to me. This is so important. Friends, the most important reason God has given you a mouth is so that you can share the message of the gospel with people around you. This is critical. This is important. Don't lose this. There are people around you. In fact, every person you encounter will one day stand before a judge we started the sermon off talking about the courtroom situation, right? And, and, and the, the, don't be a false witness. Listen, God wants you to be a true witness so that people one day, rather than hearing a message of condemnation from the judge of their souls, will hear a message of acceptance into his kingdom. God is using you to bridge the gap between heaven and earth so that people can hear the message that will bring them from earth to heaven. 
We have been given our mouths, we've been given our tongues above all so that we can communicate the truth of the gospel. And when we do that, friends, we build a bridge into eternity for the lives of people around us. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we confess our need for you. <clears throat> Lord, it's easy in this world to just go along. But Lord, let us be people who speak gospel truth. Who extend your love and your kingdom into the lives of the people around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. And all God's people said, thank you, Adam Barr. Blessings from the brother.